All right, no questions on any of these. Okay, then we're going to transition from electrical signaling to chemical signaling today. Um, because one of the questions that could have been up here is what is the purpose of an action potential? And of course that's to elicit neurotransmitter release. And that's what today's about. I'm going to edit this out. That's what today is about. Neurotransmitter release. Um, we're going to be talking about how this occurs and then some of the more common neurotransmitters and then a few unconventional transmitters uh, because they have unique release properties. But for most of your neurotransmitters, this is what it's all about. We've got our synapse here. We're going to see a little vesicle fusion that's going to allow neurotransmitter to escape into the synaptic cleft. What happens after that is the topic for next lecture. So when the action potential travels down the axon, it's going to activate voltage-gated sodium and potassium channels. And at presynaptic sites, it's going to activate voltage-gated calcium channels. So same idea, but different ion selectivity. We're going to let calcium flow in, and that calcium is going to cause some sort of change. Calcium is a secondary messenger, meaning that it can act on intracellular proteins and modify their function. Some of those proteins are going to be involved in neurotransmitter release. Some folks debate about what it means to be a neurotransmitter. Um, and that's because as we continue to study the brain, we find new neurotransmitters that defy those conventional rules that we set up for what it means to be a neurotransmitter. I think some basic characteristics that are universal would be that neurons make it, and they release it in an activity-dependent manner, and that it does something. And it does something specific. There are targets that it binds to, and their function changes. So neurotransmitters are things that are made in neurons and released when neurons are active and that do something. Some of the classical characteristics that we sort of had to brush to the wayside would be that they're stored in vesicles. That's not always true. We'll see at the end of today's talk that there are some neurotransmitters that you can't store in vesicles. Maybe they don't target postsynaptic sites. We're going to see today that we have retrograde neurotransmitters that will go from dendrite to axon and affect the presynaptic side. This way both neurons that are involved, presynaptic and postsynaptic, know what the other is doing. They can talk to each other. So they actually have a conversation rather than just a one-way delivery of orders. They can go back and forth. And having some sort of clearance mechanism, well that's not always true. Some neurotransmitters just fall apart. They just spontaneously degrade. You don't have to clear them. It's like disappearing ink. So these are only true for our conventional neurotransmitters, which is what we're going to focus on in the second point of today's talk. The third point is when we're going to start to break down these rules. But it's true that most neurotransmitters are going to start off in a vesicle. A vesicle is just a little sphere of membrane, and inside that sphere we have neurotransmitters. These vesicles are going to exist in two pools. They're all in the presynaptic site, and so you can tell a presynaptic site, but they're not all in the same location at the presynaptic site. So here's our presynaptic site here. Down here we have a postsynaptic neuron. The active zone, jump down here, is where we're going to have vesicle fusion. The reason that we have vesicle fusion there is because we have voltage-gated calcium channels there. And you only get fusion when you have calcium influx. We'll see why we think that a little later on. So your readily releasable pool 
is the pool of vesicles that you can readily release. They're right there at the active zone. They're docked very close to voltage-gated calcium channels, and when the action potential arrives, some of them will fuse. Probably not all. It depends on the synapse. But in the central synapses, you're probably going to have one or two vesicles fused. That's about it. It's a chance event, though. Held away from that readily releasable pool is the reserve pool. These are the, uh, this is the pool of vesicles that we hold in reserve. So these names make a whole lot of sense. Because as we're fusing our vesicles here, they disappear. Now, yeah, we'll recycle membrane and refill them. But we're going to deplete our readily releasable pool every time we fuse a vesicle. So we have to have some savings that we can pull from so we can replenish that readily releasable pool quickly. There are ways that the neuron knows how to do this. We won't talk about them. But we should appreciate that as we're fusing vesicles here, we've got backups, and they'll find their way down to the active zone. So that we always have a handful of vesicles docked and ready to fuse whenever the action potential arrives. So we're starting off in step one here, calcium influence. This is the purpose of the action potential, to depolarize the presynaptic terminal enough that we open up voltage-gated calcium channels. We concentrate these just in the active zone so they're not scattered along the axon like voltage-gated sodium channels, calcium channels. Those are just to create depolarization and repolarize the membrane potential. That depolarization is brought down in the action potential opens calcium channels and active zones to allow for local calcium influx that's going to drive neurotransmitter release. This calcium influx here is going to drive the fusion of vesicles in our readily releasable pool. The reason we think that calcium is so important is because it is. Um, if you remove calcium, you don't see postsynaptic currents, at least evoked postsynaptic currents. And that's what we're looking at in this illustration here. So to gather these data, they used electrical stimulation of a presynaptic neuron and recorded in the postsynaptic neurons. So what we're seeing here would be an excitatory postsynaptic current. See that inward current there? That means it's depolarizing. This dotted line shows you the same stimulation in the presence of cadmium. Cadmium is going to stick into and block voltage-gated calcium channels. So we block calcium channels, stimulate our presynaptic neuron electrically, and we see no postsynaptic current. Nothing is going on in the next neuron because we don't have neurotransmitter release because we didn't allow calcium influx. We still have these little things called minis. Don't worry about this. This is just spontaneous release. It's just chitter-chatter that neurons always have going on. But if you compare the scale, you'll notice that our evoked currents are much larger. We're talking about 5,000 picoamps compared to 20. That's our scale bars there. Now, when we remove calcium, no neurotransmitter release. What if we just add calcium? Well, then we get neurotransmitter release. We don't need to elicit an action potential. That's only done to allow calcium influx. You can bypass it by applying uh, what we call caged calcium into the cell. This is, uh, these are calcium ions that are surrounded by another molecule, which is light sensitive. So when you shine a blue light on this caged calcium, the cage falls apart and calcium is free to move about the cell. This top portion is just showing you essentially the brightness of light and how much calcium they're measuring is shown here. So we have a thin line, a thick line, and a dotted line showing us low, medium, and high amounts of light, and thus low, medium, and high amounts of calcium. X is just time in all of these, so they're synced up. So we're applying different amounts of light, getting different amounts of calcium, and we're measuring different amplitudes of postsynaptic currents. That's the bottom there. Shine a little bit of light, get a little bit of calcium, get a small postsynaptic response. A little more light, a little more response. A lot of light, a lot of response. 
You don't need action potentials, you just need calcium. Get rid of it, no release. Add it without an action potential, get release. So it all comes down to calcium. It's not the depolarization per se. But if you're a normal neuron, you don't have cage calcium, there's not a lot of light hitting you, you're probably encased in the skull, and so you're going to rely on the action potential to drive depolarization, which then opens your voltage-gated calcium channels, creating these really uh, robust but local influxes of calcium. They're called calcium microdomains because we're not filling the whole cell with calcium. We're just increasing calcium right at the active zone. So here we're looking immediately when the uh, actual potential hits and then a little bit later. All those little dots there, all those little holes are uh, symbolizing voltage-gated calcium channels. Some of them have opened as we can see. Again, molecules uh, are going to act by chance. So some of them open, not necessarily all. And the pink here is showing you calcium concentrations. The pinker it is, the higher the calcium. They've also labeled here. Now we should remember that intracellular calcium levels stay very, very low. We don't want to have an elevated intracellular calcium level. Not for prolonged periods of time. It'll kill us. So we buffer our calcium and keep it very low. Sub micromolar. About 0.1 micromolar. All the others are in millimolar concentrations. But not calcium, we keep that very low. And that creates an enormous driving force for calcium. Because we have a strong diffusive force, calcium is going to reverse at very positive potentials, which we'll never reach with the action potential. So it's always being pushed into the cell. When we open our voltage gated calcium channels, calcium rushes in right around those open channels, elevating calcium levels at least a thousand fold. So a fairly robust signal. Massive change in calcium concentrations right there at the active zone. Away from the active zone, we only see about a 10% increase as opposed to a 100,000% increase. So your signal to noise ratio is incredible because we rapidly buffer our calcium levels. At the presynaptic side, what they're not showing you here would be the mitochondria and the smooth endoplasmic reticulum that's going to chelate that calcium. It's going to pull it. I'm sorry, sequester the calcium. It's going to pull it into those membranes so we keep our cytoplasmic levels very low. So we get very local and very transient increases in calcium. And that's going to allow for a brief period of time where we can release neurotransmitters. The release of neurotransmitters is going to be driven by snare proteins. Um, snare proteins are used throughout the cell. They're not just used for neurotransmitter release. If you're familiar with trafficking through your endoplasmic reticulum and Golgi, you've probably heard of snare proteins before. Um, they essentially trap each other, like, a, like you'd snare a rabbit if you're living in the wild or something like that. So they'll, they'll latch onto each other, and they're going to snare uh, or latch onto the vesicle to hold it at some site whether that be moving a vesicle through your endomembrane system or using a presynaptic vesicle with the membrane to allow neurotransmitter release. Same thing, just a different location in the cell. Um, there's a few different snare proteins that form what we call the snare complex. One of those snare proteins is going to be located on the vesicles. That's the synaptobrevin. That's the V there, vesicular snare. And T would be target membrane. So the presynaptic membrane there in the active zone. Synaptic brevin has two um, transmembrane domains. Well, no, two, two sets of alpha helices. One is a transmembrane domain, and the other is just kind of free-floating. That's this orange one here. So there's one alpha helix embedded into the membrane, so it's sticking into the vesicle. And then the other one is hanging outside where it can interact with other snare proteins. One of those would be syntaxin, which is very much like synaptic brevin, but instead of sticking into the vesicle, it sticks into the presynaptic membrane. That's the yellow one here. And it has one additional alpha helix floating around out here that's going to form that snare complex. And holding this whole thing together is SNAP25. 
This is not embedded in the membrane, so it's a peripheral protein rather than integral. And it's going to use its two alpha helices to hold these other two all together to form this snare complex. So this is kind of like a handshake uh, between a few different sets of proteins. But that's what they're doing, they're shaking hands here. And it's not a firm grip at this point. We don't firm up our grip until calcium comes in. So it's a bit of a weak handshake, but what that does is hold the vesicle docked at the, at the active zone. We don't firm up our handshake and pull it in close until calcium comes in. Now there are a variety of accessory proteins that are going to regulate snare complex interactions. Um, the ones that you need to know about are going to come up soon. Really the only one that I care about would be semitagmin. Um, complexity is probably a little important, but semitagmin is undoubtedly uh, critical for this process. Because semitagmin is the calcium binding protein that we find in the pre synaptic site. <coughs> Sentagmin is the protein that's going to change its function based on calcium concentrations. There's two ways that sentagmin likely causes vesicular fusion. They're summarized here and we'll go through them in a bit of detail. Sentagmin is embedded in vesicles, just like our V snare here, synaptobrevin. Vesicles are going to be littered with a, a variety of proteins. Some of them are used to put neurotransmitters in. Others are used to drive vesicle fusion and push neurotransmitters out. Synaptotagmin is a calcium binding protein that we find on vesicles. And it seems to be able to do two different things. The first thing that it could do is insert into the membrane. So we're going to consider this pathway here. So we have a bunch of proteins. That's all we're looking at here. Some of them are on vesicles. Some of them are on the target membrane. So here's our presynaptic membrane, and here's our vesicle. We got our V snare and synaptic tagment here, the calcium sensor. We're going to go down the right-handed path here. So when we're primed, synaptic tagment is outside of your snare complex. So we're not thinking about the snare complex right now. Synaptic tagment's out there floating around. What it's going to do is insert into the membrane to pull the vesicle closer and drive fusion. That's one of the things that it could do, because when uh, synaptotagmin is bound with calcium, it's able to actually stick into the lipid bilayer, disrupting its stability. So it's a lot easier then to fuse the vesicle membrane with the presynaptic membrane when that presynaptic membrane is already falling apart. So we're essentially whittling a little hole into the membrane so it's easier to disrupt it. That's one thing that synaptotagmin could be doing. It could disrupt presynaptic membrane stability, which would facilitate vesicular fusion. The other thing that it could do is promote a tighter snare complex handshake by kicking out some of those accessory proteins that are in the way. Think of the accessory proteins as kind of like you know, big gaudy rings or something, and you don't want a tight handshake there, it's gonna hurt. And so take the rings off so you can have a nice firm handshake and your fingers don't hurt in the end. So we're gonna go down the left-handed path here, where synaptotagmin is now part of the snare complex, rather than just inserting into the membrane, acting all by itself. It could also insert into the snare complex. And complexin here is one of those big gaudy rings, one of those accessory proteins that kind of sticks in and keeps our snare complex a little spread apart. So they're not interacting as tightly as they could. When synaptotagmin uh, binds calcium, that allows it to then kick out complexin and maybe other little gaudy pieces of jewelry here to tighten that snare complex interaction. Those intermolecular interactions are going to pull the vesicle closer. As we can see, distance is gone. We've tightened our handshake. And they'll release more than enough free energy 
to drive vesicular fusion, to make the fusion of these membranes thermodynamically favorable because we're not having to organize our water around this loosey-goosey handshake. They're all tightened up together. So it could do either one of those. It probably does both. It's probably both of these things going on because we don't just have one synaptagmin on the vesicle. There are many. There are many copies of synaptagmin and it likely has a couple of functions, both of which are driving vesicular fusion. That's its job. When calcium comes in, synaptotagmin binds that calcium and inserts into the membrane, making it easier to fuse, and tightens up this nerve complex, pulling the vesicle closer and releasing free energy that we're going to use to drive that fusion. So they're both going on. Because our vesicles are sitting there docked with that loose snare complex handshake, the event of fusion is rapid. We're not talking milliseconds here, we're sub-milliseconds. A couple hundred microseconds after the actual potential arrives, we're spitting out neurotransmitter. You don't want to delay, because the longer it takes you to go from electrical to chemical, the longer it takes you to sense what's going on and respond to what's going on in your environment. So we want immediately transition. We want to immediately transition between these two different phases in our uh, nerve signaling pathways. We're not sure at this point, because it's really hard to see what's going on with something that's so fast and so small. We're not sure whether or not there's any sort of um, formation of essentially channels by the snare complex. There could be some sort of protein line fusion core. Maybe, we don't know. It's hard to say because this is so quick. This is an idea that we can't yet discard. But most certainly, when we fuse our membranes, we create a hole that's now continuous with the extracellular fluid. So when our membranes fuse, the neurotransmitter is going to exit that fusion pore, which is what this is, and diffuse out into the synaptic cleft. This is going to be a very quick event. What would also be a quick event is depletion of your presynaptic pool of vesicles. There's a finite number of these things. So here's our synapse. This is an electron micrograph of the synapse. Here's the cartoon, a little easier to digest, I'd say. We're always pulling membrane back. After we fuse, we're going to recycle that membrane to form a new vesicle, but it's empty. We'll just refill it and hold it in our reserve pool, shuttle it down to the readily releasable pool as needed. And it will be needed. On average, we're going to have about 270 vesicles in the presynaptic cycle. Sounds like a lot. We're going to be releasing one or two every time we have an active potential. It doesn't sound like much, but it's enough to get the job done in the central nervous system. Now, your neurons aren't just sitting there quietly. They're active all day. Many of them are going to uh, generate action potentials constantly. Let's consider a very humble 10 hertz. 10 action potentials per second. By no means is that on the high end of normal activity. It's going to take you about 20 seconds to use up all of those vesicles. So you have to recycle these if you'd like to live longer than 20 seconds. Presumably you would. And you do because we're always pulling the membrane back, refilling it, and sticking it back into the active zone. So recycling is important. Most definitely, we have to do this here. All right, any questions on this? Okay, let's review these and then we'll move ahead. Okay, let's forge ahead. No? Go ahead and finish your bite. And then tell me whether you agree with that statement that we we need depolarizing membrane potentials in order to release neurotransmitter. I do not agree with it. Why? Because uh, neurotransmitter release is dependent on calcium influx to cause synaptic vesicle fusion, which will cause neurotransmitter release, but you don't necessarily need an action potential for 
That sounds reasonable. Does everyone agree with that? Not all the time. Oh, not all the time. Oh. So there are very few hard and fast rules in life, and <laughs> the details matter. So why don't you agree with that? Well, if we don't have light, then the galaxy doesn't get out. So we get the action. Yeah. Yeah, so technically, you could get around that. But realistically, we need them. But they aren't directly driving that neurotransmitter release. You could argue either way. It just depends on how you're looking at it. And oftentimes, arguments arise because of that. You're just looking at the same thing in slightly different ways. And when you talk about it, it's all good. You get along. So the moral of the story is always talk about it. All right, let's talk about the snare complex and synaptic tagging. Um, what is a snare complex? Courtney. Um, the snare complex primes the vesicles in uh, IRP for release, and it allows specific targeting of the vesicles to the target membrane. Absolutely true. I couldn't have said it better myself. What does all that mean? <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about it. Well, first of all, let's label some things. Tell me about my different types of snares. What do I have? Um, the B snares and the T snares. Fantastic. What does B mean? Vesicle and then T is target. Excellent. What's this blue vesicular snare here? What do we call that one? Uh, maybe that one's synapto -driven. Synapto tagnant? <laughs> <laughs> uh, you tell me. One of those is a calcium sensor. Okay. We'll get to it. What's up? It's really hard to tell the colors. Sorry. It's okay. A little better? Okay, cool. Now they're screwed. But they're not here to defend themselves. Okay. Here's our snare complex. What's our V snare? Brother. It's got a V in it. What are these snares? How about this one down here? And then there's this peripheral protein here that's going to snap it all together and it's 25 kilodaltons large, so it's 25. It's kind of like a little paper clip, I suppose. So there's our snare complex. Now you said that that docks and primes vesicles. What does that mean? Does that make sense to anyone at all? Because if it doesn't, then let's clear it up. It's okay if it doesn't. Doesn't make sense at all. Great. How about what? Well, it says, "Hey, come here, and then go connect to that." Yeah. So, "Hey, come here," docking, like a boat. Boats come to shore, docks. That's the place where they have to land. So, here's your dock. How do we know where the active zone is? We just <coughs> stick a T snare down there, and the V snare is going to stick to it. That's the only way that the protein's going to know where to go. It has somewhere that it can stick to, and then other places where it can't stick to. So these are just going to kind of bounce around to some degree throughout the cell, and synaptobrevin here, our V snare, is only going to stick where it can, and that's where we put our T snares. So that's what we mean by docking. And the priming would be forming that, that weak handshake. So getting it, so it's very, very close the membrane, but not quite ready yet. We're not fusing, but we are ready to fuse. This way, within a couple hundred microseconds, we're going to release neurotransmitter. I got another protein over here. If you look at the question, you'll know what I'm talking about. What protein is this? Excellent. Synaptotagmin, this is our calcium sensor. 
When calcium comes in, it's going to bind this nephrotagmin, and then that's going to do something. Leo, what is synaptotagmin going to do? That's going to get rid of all the accessory things that complex Oh, okay. Great. So there's, there's actually some stuff in here. Big, gaudy pieces of jewelry. They're holding this in a loose conformation. So all these things that we're probably not seeing very well. The GLO. These are our accessory proteins. One example would be complexin, just in case you want a name there. So you're telling me synaptotagmin is going to kick those out. So that's one of the things that it could do. Synaptotagmin can come in and take off all the rings. There they go. So one possibility is that we remove the accessories. And what that's going to do is stabilize the snare complex. Firm handshake. What else could synaptic tag be doing? Stephanie Smith. It could either like attach itself to the membrane and then directly insert itself in the membrane to allow for vessel fusion. Yeah. The other possibility is that we just stab the membrane and destabilize it. And that's going to make it easier to actually force these two membranes together. That's thermodynamically unfavorable. These are both very stable structures. That hydrophobic core makes it unlikely that our membrane ever falls apart, because if it does, we have to organize water around it. And that's just going to increase order, and that never happens in life. So the second option is to stab the membrane. When we insert into the membrane, that'll destabilize it. When we remove the accessories, that'll stabilize the snare. So we're pulling our vesicle closer to an unstable membrane and allowing fusion to take place. When we fuse, we release neurotransmitters here. It's probably doing both of those things. But it's hard to say. So it's not either or, it's doing both? I would imagine they it's doing both. There's evidence that it's doing both of those. And there's no reason that it has to be one or the other. Just like this. You don't have to agree or disagree, you can do both. It depends. Okay, anything to go over here? Cool. Well, let's talk about a few neurotransmitters then. We're going to go through the classic neurotransmitters here. Um, and with the exception of acetylcholine, these are all either amino acids or a few enzymatic massages away from an amino acid. <coughs> the most common neurotransmitters in your central nervous system would be these three, glutamate, GABA, and glycine. Glutamate is the principal excitatory neurotransmitter throughout the entire CNS. If there's an excitatory synapse in the central nervous system, go ahead and guess it's glutamate. You'll be right about 90% of the time. That's good enough for an A. I guess an A minus. But it's still pretty good. GABA and glycine are both inhibitory. They're both going to act on chloride channels. But you find them in different parts of the central nervous system. GABA is a lot more abundant in the cerebrum, whereas glycine is going to be down in the brainstem and spinal cord. They're both throughout. It's not a hard line of all GABA, all glycine. 
it's more GABA up top and more glycine on the bottom. Here's glutamate, here's GABA. You can see they're very similar to one another. We just decarboxylate glutamate, and that's what GAD stands for, glutamic acid decarboxylase. So we're removing a carboxyl group from glutamic acid or glutamate, and we have GABA. One step. We can turn GABA back into glutamate. There's a few ways of doing that. You can reverse this reaction, or you can go through the GABA shunt here, and that will eventually make glutamate as well. And we're not going to transport glutamate directly into the central nervous system because it's an excitatory neurotransmitter. So we don't pick glutamate up. We can pick up glutamine. That's totally fine, and we'll see this again. Glutamine can be converted to glutamate in a one-step enzymatic reaction. And we can also make glutamate from glucose indirectly because one of the precursors to glutamate is a component of the citric acid cycle ketoglutarate down there. So there is definitely a link between metabolism and neurotransmission. Neurotransmission is going to increase the metabolic load of the cell. We're going to be moving ions. We're going to have to pump them back out. But we're also, in some ways, robbing it of metabolic substrates that it could use to create ATP as well. So it's carefully linked with one another. Uh, glycine is derived from another amino acid, serine. This is an amino acid itself, uh, so it's glutamate. So we have a couple of amino acids. GABA is just a decarboxylated glutamate. So just some amino acids. We'll make them, package them into vesicles, spit them out, uh, and after we spit them out, we need to clear them. We don't enzymatically degrade any of these transmitters. Instead, we just remove them from the synapse. So here's a cartoon representation of a synapse. Here's our presynaptic site. We spit out glutamate. It'll bind to some receptors. More on that uh, next lecture. And then it gets removed from the synapse through excitatory amino acid transporters. Neurons have them. Glia have them. Both of them are going to remove glutamate from the synapse. If you don't, this leads to excitotoxicity, death of the neuron, death of the organism. Refer back to lecture one uh, for the data on that. And the same thing is true for GABA and glycine. There are also GABA and glycine transporters on neurons and glia. Here is an immunostain for the GABA transporter. Here's our synapse. We can tell this is the presynaptic site from all those vesicles. Here's our postsynaptic site. And then here's a perisynaptic extension from an astrocyte. And all the dark spots here, that show you oops, where the antibody stuck. So this uh, GABA transporter is specific for astrocytes rather than neurons. So they have their own transporters, but they all do the same thing. Remove the neurotransmitter. Um, after removal, we're going to recycle. We have to recycle our membrane. We also need to recycle our neurotransmitters so we can refill that recycled membrane. And these are all linked to metabolism. They're costly to make. So we want to recycle them. We don't want to just waste good neurotransmitter. So after they're removed, if they're taken up into the neuron, they can just directly package those back into a vesicle one step. If they're taken into an astrocyte, they need to be enzymatically converted to glutamine. Glutamate gets converted to glutamine directly. GABA is first converted to glutamate, then glutamine. But either way, whether it's GABA or glutamate, it doesn't matter. We turn it into glutamine because this isn't a neurotransmitter, so we can spit this out. Glutamine isn't going to activate any receptors on that neuron, but if you spat out glutamate or GABA, you'd excite or inhibit that neuron. We don't want to do that. We just want to recycle. So we get the glutamine. Then we convert that to glutamate. We can convert that further to GABA if this is an inhibitory synapse, which it is. Package it back into a vesicle and repeat. Uh, 
So the neuron's always going to be pulling membrane off to create new vesicles, and there's always going to be some recycling of neurotransmitters, especially for these very common conventional transmitters like glutamate, GABA, glycine. Very simple, fast, and efficient recycling because you use them all day at the majority of your synapses. Acetylcholine is another common neurotransmitter. Uh, this one is also derived from uh, some of our metabolic substrates, so we're going to rob the mitochondrion of a little acetyl-CoA because we're going to take the acetyl group off of that, put it onto a choline. The enzyme that catalyzes this is choline acetyltransferase, or CHAC, and that'll make acetylcholine. So it's not an amino acid like glutamate, glycine. We're taking this, this metabolic substrate, though, so there is that commonality between them. And then we'll package it into a vesicle, fuse it, and spit out our acetylcholine. We don't just directly take up acetylcholine. First, we break it down. We won't recycle that acetate. We will take in the choline through choline transporters. So there are enzymes that will break down acetylcholine. We have our synthetic enzymes, and then we have our enzymes that degrade it, acetylcholinesterase. These break down acetylcholine and keep acetylcholine levels low. When you inhibit them, acetylcholine levels build up. This can lead to um, tonic depolarization and paralysis there. So we'll use drugs that modify the activity of this enzyme uh, during the surgery, for example, to keep a limb still or something like that. Because one of the important functions of acetylcholine is to work out there in the peripheral nervous system. And this is largely where we'll be talking about it. It's going to come up a little bit later. There are a few cholinergic populations in the brain. Uh, and when we talk about the limbic system in the fourth unit, they'll come up again because uh, they'll feed into uh, certain structures like the hippocampus that are relevant for memory. So they're going to drive um, excitation here to help promote memory. Because acetylcholine, at least in the central nervous system, is usually excitatory. In the periphery, it's also usually excitatory, certainly at the neuromuscular junction. Uh, more on this in unit two. But acetylcholine is there to help cause contraction of striated muscle. Uh, it's also going to act on non-striated muscle through the autonomic nervous system. All the preganglionic neurons are gonna release it, and then the parasympathetic nervous system is gonna use acetylcholine to target smooth cardiac muscle. So we've transitioned away from the central nervous system here whenever we enter acetylcholine. This is going to be used kind of throughout the body. Somewhat limited in the central nervous system, although we have a few populations of neurons shown here in the rat brain. Same for humans. The less common neuromodulatory transmitters are going to include your catecholamines, like dopamine, norepinephrine, very rarely epinephrine, and serotonin. So these are all what we call the monoamines because they have a single amine uh, group on them. You'll recall in your chemistry here. Their synthesis is pretty similar. I've, I've lined them up here because there's quite a bit of overlap, certainly between serotonin and dopamine. Pretty much identical. We start with different amino acids, tyrosine or tryptophan. That amino acid hydroxylase, so for tyrosine, the enzyme tyrosine hydroxylase is going to add a hydroxyl, exactly what it says it does, onto tyrosine. This forms DOPA, which we then decarboxylate with L-aromatic amino acid decarboxylase. So that enzyme does exactly what it says it does. We remove a carboxyl group and make dopamine. Same thing for serotonin, except we start with tryptophan. We hydroxylate it and then decarboxylate it, and then we have serotonin. You can write all this stuff down, you don't need to remember it. But they're remarkably similar. But by starting with a different amino acid, you end up with a different neurotransmitter. If you're a noradrenergic neuron, you have to take it a step further, you take that dopamine, and use that to synthesize norepinephrine. 
so we'll just be adding this hydroxyl group here. The weird thing about this is that this has to happen in a vesicle because the enzyme that carries this out is not floating around in the cytoplasm. It's contained in vesicles. So we package dopamine, but we spit out norepinephrine. And if you're one of those crazy neurons that releases epinephrine, that means you have to package dopamine, turn it into norepinephrine, spit it out, take it back up, and then turn it into epinephrine. Because the enzyme that makes epinephrine is found in the cytoplasm. So it's a little weird. But it's basically the same thing. You start with some precursor, and there are enzymes that change it one step at a time to create neurotransmitters. These can be further modified and form other neurotransmitters. And in fact, the, the degradation products of neurotransmitters might themselves also be neurotransmitters, adding another layer of complexity, which we won't talk about. Now, whenever we're talking about these neuromodulatory Transmitters. Very few neurons use them, so we can actually localize them to specific areas of the central nervous system. You can't localize glutamate neurons, they're everywhere. If we were to color where we have glutamatergic neurons, this whole thing would be purple. GABA, we have a whole lot of purple here, it'd be slightly lighter purple here, and glutamine, or, or glycine would be flipped. Not true for our monoamine neurons or cholinergic neurons either. They're localized in very specific areas of the central nervous system. Dopamine neurons are going to be found in the midbrain in about two locations, your, your substantia nigra and your ventral segmental area. We'll bring these up later. Um, they're going to target different areas of the higher CNS, so they're going to project upward and release dopamine throughout the nervous system to affect the activity in their targets. If you're the substantia nigra, you're going to project up into the basal ganglia and affect decision making. Should I carry out this action or not? When they're lost, it becomes difficult to initiate movement. Other dopamine neurons in the ventral tegmental area have different targets. They can affect memory, mood, because they target different areas of the central nervous system. But they're all releasing dopamine. They have that in common. They're all found right there next to each other in the midbrain. But they create a few different pathways that are going to target different areas of the brain and thus have different effects, whether it's movement, memory, or mood. It's not the neurotransmitter that makes that difference. It's their target. We still find our discrete populations, when we talk about the other monoamines like norepinephrine, that's down there in the locus ceruleus, also in the tegmentum, so in the brainstem. And then of course out there in the synthetic nervous system as well. So outside the central nervous system we're going to find noradrenergic neurons. They are the postganglionic component of the sympathetic nervous system. More on that later when we talk about the autonomic nervous system. But whether you're central or peripheral, you're still releasing norepinephrine, that's going to bind to its receptors and modify cell function. We'll talk about their receptors in the next lecture. But discrete populations, they're not scattered throughout. That's the only important point here. Same thing for serotonin. Different nuclei, it's in the graphene, which is a collection of nuclei throughout the brainstem, and they're going to project throughout the nervous system as well. These are relatively rare, but they serve the entire brain. These are all going to be regulated through reuptake and enzymatic degradation. So they have both, both mechanisms here. So reuptake um, is going to be mediated through, for catecholamines, both dopamine and norepinephrine transporters. And don't let the name fool you. They're not as specific as the name says. Dopamine transporters don't just transport dopamine. That's just what they transported when we initially characterized them. But it turns out they'll, they'll transport any old catecholamine. Doesn't matter. The reason that we think this is because of the effects of drugs. And many drugs target these proteins. 
these are highly addictive drugs because they are going to affect dopamine signaling. And dopamine is very important for regulating mood and reward. And so if you take a drug that creates the sensation of reward, that you've done something really good, you're going to do that drug again. Cocaine is a prime example. This is going to inhibit dopamine transporters. So it's going to help dopamine levels build up. As a result, we're not removing it from the synapse. But cocaine is addictive even if you don't have dopamine transporters. Let's walk through these plots here. We're looking at the number of cocaine injections. All you have to do to get some cocaine is press a lever. It's just that simple if you're a lab rat. Maybe life in the lab isn't so bad after all. <laughs> Here's time. And I want you to notice the positive relationship here. They notice when I press that lever, it feels pretty good. I want to do that again. This is rewarding. And you'll notice over time, each animal, which is each line here with its, with its own little shape, increases over time. They're not pressing it less frequently. Rodents like cocaine. <laughs> Rodents without dopamine transporters still like cocaine. So what they've done is knock out dopamine transporters. That's what this DAT is. And the minus minus is just telling you that both copies are removed. No dopamine transporters. If it was only dopamine transporters that were taking up dopamine, then we wouldn't see any effect of, of cocaine here. But it's not just dopamine transporters that take it up. They still have their norepinephrine transporters, which are still going to be inhibited. And we're still going to have dopamine building up. So we're still going to see this positive relationship. When they start, when they happen to press the lever, then they realize, oh, that feels pretty good. So you'll notice they start at different times, sure, because they just didn't happen to press the lever. But once they did, it's off to the races. So don't let the name fool you. Uh, we also have serotonin transporters as well. They transport serotonin. And they're also targeted by drugs as well antidepressants. They're going to prevent serotonin reuptake, which is going to allow serotonin to build up and then make the synapse less sensitive to serotonin. So it actually kind of does the opposite of what most people think that it does. In addition to reuptake, we also have enzymes that will degrade the monoamines. Some of them are found within the synapse. Monoamine oxidase, for example, this is intracellular, and then some of them are extracellular out there in the synapse, COMT. These are also targets for drugs. Mood elevators, sometimes inhibit these, kind of like inhibiting the transporter. When you inhibit the enzyme that degrades the neurotransmitter, you get elevated levels of that neurotransmitter. Now, what those neurotransmitters do, well, that depends on what receptor we're talking about. But we're not going to talk about those today. That'll be the next lecture. And then probably the rest of the class. Any questions? I got some uh, hateful looks, so I'm just gonna advance. This is why I let you use notes. Let's talk about glutamate and GABA. These are really common. You should know these. Jessica. So, um, let's talk about their recycling. Run me through it. We're going to start at the moment, so we've released. Okay. Go. So, um, they can be reuptaken directly by presynaptic transporters, um, or they can be reuptaken on astrophytes and recycled. The, uh, the GABA glutamate glycine cycle. They have to be um, metabolized. GABA has to be metabolized by GABA some trans in the name. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. That word. Mm -hmm. Yeah. To form glutamate and then it's converted to glutamine. Um, and then the glutamine is shuttled to the back of the neuron to be synthesized to make glutamate or GABA. Why do we go through that, all that hassle? Why don't you turn into glutamate? Because it's excitatory and you don't want it to be able to interact. Oh, there we go. So we want to spit out something that's not a neurotransmitter, but very, very close to it. Yeah, so we just need one, maybe two enzymes 
to recreate that initial neurotransmitter. And we use these all the time, so it makes sense that we want to have a very efficient recycling mechanism in place. But we don't have enzymatic degradation. That would just slow things down. That's okay to do in the less common neurotransmitters. But not for these. Speaking of enzymatic degradation, which neurotransmitters are going to be broken down in the synapse? Callie. So acetylcholine and the catecholamines like dopamine, norepinephrine, and epi are going to be broken down in enzymatic degradation. And the catecholamines are also going to be broken down for um, reuptake as well as serotonin. Great. And then serotonin, also monoamine, so the COMT and monoamine oxidase can target that too. So we will also break down serotonin. Just lump serotonin and your catecholamines all together, just like we did for the synthesis. Same thing is true for the, the breakdown. We have enzymes that will target that. And there's reuptake as well. We won't directly reuptake acetylcholine. First we break that one down. Um, okay, describe the synthesis of catecholamines. We're just going to move on. Um, <laughs> it's not a great question, I think. You can just look this up anytime you need to. But I hope that you're getting that we're starting with some amino acid. We're going to add hydroxyl, move a carboxylic acid. And then we're in dopamine or serotonin. Okay. You can look that stuff up. Not important to remember that. But we should remember that not every neurotransmitter is going to be released from the presynaptic site in a, in a synaptic vesicle that fuses. Sometimes we're not at the presynaptic site, and sometimes we're not in the vesicle. There are other neurotransmitters besides those classical ones that we just covered. First of all, your neuropeptides, which have been brought up before, these aren't your classical transmitters. They're a little unique. We don't recycle these. We don't have the means to recreate peptides in the presynaptic site. No protein synthesis. Therefore, no reconstruction of neuropeptides. Once we release them, they get broken down, and those breakdown products might act as transmitters uh, as well but they'll be further broken down. They will not be recycled. Another big distinction is the site of release. Here's our active zone down here. We have all our synaptic vesicles. They're not showing you the reserve pool. They're showing you a different population of vesicles. They call dense core vesicles because the core is electron dense, which just tells you there's a bunch of protein in there. That's it. They're a little bit bigger and they're full of neuropeptides. We localize these at extrasynaptic sites, away from the active zone. So it, re it requires multiple action potentials, stacking up over time and accumulating calcium. So we get a little bit of influx here on the first one, the second one, the third one. After a nice burst of action potentials, our extrasynaptic sites have an appreciable increase in calcium, and we drive vesicle fusion there but it requires a burst. Neurons have to be active, highly active, uh, in order to release their neural peptides because they're away from the active zone. And they're kept there because they're expensive. You don't want to spit these out unless you really need to. So you need a burst. These are going to be, re be released extrasynaptically and diffuse over a much larger area as a result. We're not spitting them out here immediately adjacent to the target receptors. We're spitting them out away. So they're going to act like some of the catecholamines can over a much larger area. Their receptors are going to be the metabotropic kind, which we'll talk about in the next lecture. They're not going to generate fast synaptic currents. They're going to generate slower, more long-lived changes in cell function. So they're going to affect metabolism, if you will. That's what we call them metabotropic. 
a better term for that would be G protein couple receptors. Okay, next lecture. Let's not over complicate this. Adenosine is uh, a, a transmitter that's released from neurons as well as glia, and it's often co released with neurotransmitters. So you don't find uh, a synapse that only has adenosine added, no exclusively uh, adenosine synapses. You'll find it released along with other neurotransmitters. So it's a co transmitter. You will find synapses that are purely glutamatergic or GABAergic. That's not true here. We release adenosine along with others in order to affect that postsynaptic target. Now, depending on where you're at, you're going to have different adenosine receptors that are going to produce different effects. This will make a whole lot more sense after the next lecture. You do want to know what GI coupled means, because it's going to come up time and time again. It just means it's going to inhibit adenyl cyclase. GS is going to stimulate adenyl cyclase. In other words, in the central nervous system, adenosine is inhibitory. And we can see that right here. When we apply adenosine to a, a cortical neuron, what do we see happening to the membrane potential? There's a little hyperpolarization there. How much hyperpolarization? Well, that depends on how much adenosine we apply. There's a dose-dependent increase in the hyperpolarization. Positive here actually just means more hyperpolarization. So adenosine is inhibitory. And indeed, when you apply adenosine and try to elicit an action potential, it's much more difficult than without that adenosine. Who cares? Well, who drinks coffee? Excellent. What does coffee do? It's going to inhibit adenosine receptors. You inhibit an inhibitor of your cortical neurons, and now your cortical neurons are more active and you feel awake. It's wonderful. That's what caffeine does for us. There's going to be some peripheral effects as well, and these will make more sense when we talk about our autonomic nervous system. But you'll feel effects of caffeine outside of just your mind. You'll feel it out there in your body as well, depending on the dose, of course. But you don't see adenosine released exclusively out of synapse. And that makes it a little weird. It's always a co-transmitter. Always a bridesmaid, never a bride. <laughs> um, getting a little bit weirder, we have uh, retrograde signals. The endocannabinoids. These are derived from lipids rather than amino acids. So they are hydrophobic by nature, meaning you can't put them in a vesicle. You can't make them and store them ahead of time. You have to make them on demand, because as soon as you make them, they can freely cross the membrane. They're hydrophobic. We made them from the stuff in the membrane. Of course it can cross. So when neurons are active and their, their dendrites are sufficiently depolarized, they can start to make endocannabinoids. And this is a negative feedback loop that neurons will form to quiet down hyperactive synapses. Because endocannabinoids are going to act on presynaptic receptors, and these are, oh, there's that GI again. I wonder if we'll continue to see that for the rest of the class and it will haunt you in your dreams. Who knows? <laughs> They're going to bind to presynaptic G protein coupled receptors and produce a long lived change. Not a fast synaptic current, but a long lived change. What that change does is decrease the amount of calcium influx that we see by inhibiting voltage gated calcium channels. So that when you apply cannabinoids, you see a decrease in the postsynaptic response. Here it is at baseline, and here it is after they've added some synthetic cannabinoid. Notice the amplitude is decreasing, and here's the raw data to show you, yes, it did indeed decrease. When you block this presynaptic receptor, minimal effects, if any. So cannabinoids are going to decrease release probability in our synapses, making it more difficult for neurons to communicate with one another. 
since that neural communication constructs our conscious perception and creates our memories, you can see why cannabinoids might disrupt memory, might make it more difficult to pay attention and remember things. well-known exocannabinoid would be THC. Same effect. Another retrograde messenger that you can't put in the vesicle is nitric oxide. This is going to turn up release. So this can increase the strength of synapses. Similar to endocannabinoids in that they can be released from the postsynaptic site communicate with the presynaptic side. You can't put it in the vesicle either. Nitric oxide will freely move through membranes, so you have to make it on demand. The key distinction here would be their effect. Nitric oxide is going to facilitate calcium influx. Thus, we're going to see an increase in release. And that's what we're seeing here. When we inhibit nitric oxide synthesis, right here. The, the open circles are without any drugs added. This way you can just see the stability across time for the amount of acetylcholine that they're measuring. When they inhibit nitric oxide synthesis, notice that drops. We're decreasing neurotransmitter release. Whenever we add a nitric oxide donor, whenever we bump up nitric oxide levels, notice the dramatic increase in neurotransmitter release. So this allows neurons to then have a conversation. The presynaptic site's releasing neurotransmitters to affect the postsynaptic site, but it's also true that the postsynaptic site can release neurotransmitters, although not necessarily conventional, that then affect the presynaptic site. They can cross through the membrane and affect intracellular targets. They don't have to bind to a receptor on the surface. And that's why we had to throw out some of those original rules for what makes a neurotransmitter because of weird transmitters like nitric oxide and our endocannabinoids. Because they're still neurotransmitters. Neurons are making them. They're releasing them. They're having some effect. Isn't that the whole purpose of a neurotransmitter? Who cares if it's in a vesicle? The presynaptic side does. Any questions? Last one. Let's see what we can get through before we call up class. Okay, I want to coast through these so that we can actually hit them and then, then get out here. So if you haven't had time to talk about it, that's all right. Take your best guess. I'll, I'll put them in the blanks. Uh, Stephanie, it's not grass. Let's talk about neuropeptides. so the calcium can actually reach that site. When they're released away from the synapse, they're free to diffuse and hit multiple synapses. Okay, uh, THC is an endocannabinoid. Um, it's used to impair attention and memory. Why? Does that make any sense? Sydney. Um, the dampening of presynaptic release explains, or er, by the CD1 receptors. Okay, and it does. That's totally true. It can probably be hard to visualize or imagine what what consciousness looks like. So let's just think about something simple like me feeling that someone's tapping my shoulder. There's there's a a pathway of three neurons or so that are going to convey that message from my shoulder up into the brain. If they aren't able to communicate with one another effectively, I won't feel it. It doesn't matter if I'm being tapped or not. They can only convey that I'm being tapped if they can effectively communicate their synapses. We generate an electrical message here that's gonna spit out a chemical message elsewhere, but what if it doesn't spit out enough chemical message? And we don't stimulate the next neuron. We don't feel it. 
And so this magic of consciousness is kind of like that, but just way more complex. And it's just the pattern of activity in your cortex. And depending on what patterns you generate, that's what you're thinking. If you remember something, it's because you stored some pattern. But that pattern requires that neurons actually talk to each other. They create the pattern by communicating, and essentially building a constellation out of the many stars in your brain. So you disrupt that conversation, you decrease release probability, well, you take away some of the stars from the constellation, now it's something different. It's not the big dipper, it's a small stick. Those are different things. Uh, okay, I didn't mention degradation of nitric oxide. Sorry, I got caught up. Um, it just falls apart. It just spontaneously degrades. You don't need an enzyme to break it apart. It does the job itself. So that's the disappearing ink I mentioned uh, earlier. How about the mechanism of release? Mackenzie, how, are, how do we release nitric oxide? So it's also synthesized on demand. So it's not stored in vesicles. We just synthesize it when we need it, and then it immediately diffuses to cells before degrading. Fantastic. Yeah. Since it can cross membranes, you can't put it in a vesicle. All right. Anything else? Okay, well I thank you for the uh, two minutes, maybe a minute and a half, two and a half, I don't know. Thanks, I'll see you uh, uh, for lecture six. Doing <laughs> better? <laughs> 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 Like, I have a possible answer, but like, I'm going to ask you about it.